Hi, can, can everyone hear me okay? Um, hi, welcome to the Royal College of Art and What Should White Culture Do? Um, my name is Kira Blakey, I'm a curator at Art on the Underground. And Art on the Underground commissions contemporary art for the public realm. And we came to host this symposium with Daniel after an essay I'd read by him on um, Richard Moss's recent exhibition at the Barbican's Curve Gallery. And the essay was a critical study of whiteness. So I'm going to hand over to Daniel to introduce the programme, but just a small bit of housekeeping. Could everyone make sure their phones are turned off, please? We are recording today, um, so there will be an opportunity to listen, listen back. Please um, wait for the mics to reach you during question time. This is so that the speakers can pick up what you're saying and also the recording. And we will have breaks at 1.30, 4.30 and a drinks reception at 7.30. Thank you. Hello. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, thanks to Kira Blakey, uh, Lydia Briggs, and those at Art on the Underground. Um, they've worked tirelessly on putting this symposium together. It's really fantastic that um, uh, so many amazing people are contributing, and um, it's not always that that comes together in the way you'd hope, and I think it has, uh, from my point of view, as the individual that's programmed the day. Um, thanks to the Royal College of Art for hosting us and to my colleagues here for encouraging critical dialogue, a number of you are in the audience. Um, uh, thanks to every one of you in the audience, uh, I hope you find this stimulating. Um, I look forward to hearing from you during the Q&As of course and as Kira mentioned we have a drinks reception that everybody's invited to at 7.30 outside in the cafe area behind the lecture theatre. I'll make a few opening remarks for about, I think, 12 minutes, um, and then I'll, I'll introduce our first speaker. In her essay, Challenging a Culture of Racial Equivalence, Miri Song notes that the attention now given to racism in the media contributes to a widespread misunderstanding of its meaning. There's a lot of talk about racism, but seldom any slowing down to understand its structural implications. Song writes, quote, We live at a time when our understandings and conceptualizations of racism are often highly imprecise, broad, and used to describe a wide range of racialized phenomena. The trend toward a growing culture of racial equivalence is worrying as it denudes the idea of racism of its historical basis, severity, and power. End quote. On the one hand, some think we live in a post-race society where race is no longer a thing. And on the other hand, some individuals comport a fully-fledged colour blindness, which is a form of disengagement with structural racism altogether. This creates a closed-off culture on a large scale within which white people don't want to talk about race. Some white people even feel acts of racism are perpetrated against them. What they try to call reverse racism, which leads to this problematic culture of racial equivalence that Song engages in her essay. Even Richard Spencer, the intellectually finite alt-right swaggerer, says he has no problem with black or brown people. Apparently, we are missing the point to call him a racist, for he is only trying to ensure the survival of the white race in America. In a recent Channel 4 documentary made by the author and broadcaster Gary Young, Richard Spencer states that Africans have benefited from white supremacy. Yet simultaneously, Spencer claims not to be making an oppressive point about race. We live in a world where even neo-Nazis claim to be anti-racist. The alt-right is an alternative fascism in one sense because it, because it has the ability to appropriate the dictum and stance of anti-racism to abhorrent ends. In this problematic, deeply contradictory culture of racial equivalence within which we live, it's hard to imagine finding anyone who couldn't make some claim, however illegitimate, to be an anti-racist. I call myself an anti-racist for one set of reasons, and Richard Spencer calls himself an anti-racist for a vastly different set of reasons. It seems clear in this sense that a stance, against, a stance against oppression requires more than anti-racism and instead overt forms of anti-whiteness, 
Without asking detailed and critical questions of this culture of racial equivalence, anti-racism becomes a meaningless blur, moving at incoherent speed so as to evade definition. Proper consideration. Anti-racism seems to exist as a sort of white whirlwind. That is to say, a white thing with a hollow inside. A thing which moves at speed so as not to be dwelled on. Miri Song poses these crucial questions at the end of her essay, which we might consider in the symposium today. Quote, We still need to ask who or what is engaged in the racialized act, and with what purpose and impact. What is the content and impact of this racialized act, behavior, or policy, and does it create or reproduce structures of domination, such as racial hierarchies? What is the historical context within which particular interactions and beliefs occur? Posing such questions militates against the assertion of easy equivalences in relation to disparate forms of racialized phenomena and interactions. At the same time, in addition to the material consequences of structured inequalities, it is crucial that we discern the motivations, agendas and backstories to social phenomena which are said to be racist. To do so would strengthen not weaken our ability to make claims about racism taken seriously." End quote. The danger of not actively examining what anti-racism means is that we also potentially sidestep a discussion of something even more spectre-like, unnoticed, Delphic, often unconscious. This thing is whiteness. Much like the way Roland Barthes came to see the fashion industry as le jeu de main, a form of trickery, Anti-racism is, it might be said, a fashion statement promulgated by good whites, or bad whites in the case of Richard Spencer. The vast majority of white people declare they are anti-racist, yet fundamentally misunderstand the systemic nature of racism. In an essay outlining some of the key concepts in critical whiteness studies, Barbara Applebaum writes, quote, Confessions of privilege serve as a redemptive outlet through which white students are able to perceive themselves as good whites in comparison to those bad whites who do not acknowledge privilege. As good whites, they can disregard the ways in which their seemingly good practices may be contributing to the maintenance of systemic injustice. The assumption is that confessing to the inner workings of whiteness in their lives would redeem them from their complicity with racism. There is a danger that by acknowledging their privilege, white students may assume that they have arrived and that they do not have to worry anymore about how they are implicated in systemic racial injustice." End quote. This logic does not simply apply to students, but also more generally to professional whites in the arts and culture industries too. We can include universities in this category, not least because they are increasingly marketized, an industry which now sells degrees as commodities and treats students as customers, but also in the manner in which subject areas, such as gender or critical race studies, are often tokenistically incorporated into curricula in order to satisfy some oversimplified institutional target with regard to diversity. During a 12-week lecture series on postmodernism, you might find one of the lectures is on gender and feminism, and one undertakes a critical study of race. The rest, however, are opportunities for the largely white male Eurocentric canon to be rehearsed and recapitulated. Instead of all 12 lectures being predicated upon anti-patriarchy and anti-whiteness as guiding themes, such curricula relegates these critical approaches to mere facets of the pedagogical framework as a whole. Indeed, fast-paced and fashionable anti-racism may be the good whites' way of evading their own whiteness, expanded ad infinitum to incorporate all individuals socialized white who think that a simple declaration of anti-racism is enough. Job done. Like the man who declares, I'm a feminist, and does little about it other than to entertain the false probity of the statement, Anti-racism is often a thing that incites acts of arrival as individual expression, rather than attempts to create meaningful structural change or pedagogies of white awareness. <laughs>
This is what Barbara Applebaum calls the danger of good intentions. These intentions, when studied closely, often reveal themselves to be subtle forms of white ignorance, a white whirlwind with a hollow inside. Today's symposium is an opportunity to slow down and talk about whiteness in the white dominated space that is this university and to critically engage how whiteness affects the world of art, the world of visual culture, and as we will see today more broadly, popular culture and politics. In these social spaces, diversity is often discussed, whiteness much less so. In his essay, The Myth of White Ignorance, Zeus Leonardo argues that contrary to the widespread idea that whites don't know anything about race, whites do in fact know a lot about race, both in terms of its lived experience and its structural form as a system of privilege. He writes, quote, a critical reading of whiteness means that white ignorance must be problematized, not in order to expose whites as simply racist, but to increase knowledge about their full participation in race relations. End quote. It's tempting for white academics, artists and writers to think of race as something that is, as Leonardo writes, not their project. This, for me, is a key change that needs to take place in the thinking of white people in the arts and in education more broadly. This issue can be understood by paying attention to the difference between white racial knowledge and white racial understanding. Leonardo writes, quote, White racial knowledge is knowing how the world works in racially meaningful ways, but avoiding to name it in these terms. Whites know how to talk about race without actually having to mention the word, opting instead for terms such as ethnicity, nationality and background. Knowing how to invoke the concept of racism without having to utter the word is a trademark of the white liberal discourse. I thought I'd say some things about the title of today's symposium. What should white culture do? First, this is a reference to Linda Alcoff's essay, What Should White People Do? But it is also simultaneously and importantly a chance to discuss the paradoxes inherent in the phrase white culture. The title performs this paradox, posits a question and frames the discussion. We might ask, what could white culture even mean other than a fallacious essentialism? The word should offers the title a relation to duty or obligation. It also reflects on the fact that despite the possibilities of enacting loyalty to the abolition of forms of white cultural dominance, there is a gap between arrival and continuous action. Here I am reminded, apropos the word loyalty, of Noel Ignatiev's well-known statement, treason to whiteness is loyalty to humanity. As Jus Leonardo writes, quote, a white racial culture exists, which is intimately linked with a certain way of knowing. If by culture we accept Geertz and Erickson's definition that it signifies the combination of material rituals, symbolic meanings, and sense-making strategies that a group shares, then whites as a race appear to have a culture. It is a way of knowing the world, an epistemology." End quote. Whites know the world through a veil of ignorance. Whiteness is constituted by colonization, takeover, and denial. White culture, then, is a thing framed by a discourse of profound ignorance. White culture exists problematically, but in no straightforward sense. What should white culture do? What isn't culture doing? The interactions of these questions are complex and we'll spend some time considering them today across a variety of discussions. The first panel considers the relationship between contemporary art practice, popular culture and critical studies of race. The second panel looks at the intersection of migration studies, contemporary art and critical race studies. And finally, the third panel, concluding with George Yancey's keynote lecture, will form a discussion around the problematics of black beauty shame, the white unconscious, and white subject formation. Here, as Yancey writes in the abstract for his lecture today, 
we should understand whiteness to be a practice and an ideology that is anti-human. I hope that you find the day stimulating. Thanks again to everyone for attending. Um, I'd now like to introduce Shutapa Biswas. Shutapa Biswas is a British conceptual artist, was born in West Bengal, India, and moved to London in her family, with her family in 1966. She works across a range of media, including drawing, painting, film, digital video, performance, and photography. Biswas delves into the ways in which larger historical narratives and themes of gender, race, and cultural identities collide and conflict with personal ones. Drawing from art history, histories of trade and empire, as well as from literature and oral histories, Biswas is equally interested in the conceptual and the formal process involved in making art. She studied fine art and art history at the University of Leeds, the Slade School of Art and the Royal College of Art. She is a BAMP Fellow and a nominee of the Deutsche Bank European Photography Award. She was Andrew Mellon Fellow at the Yale Centre for British Art in 2008. Her works have been exhibited in galleries and museums widely, including Tate Modern, Tate Britain, Tate Liverpool, Art Gallery of Ontario, Havana Biennial, Yale University Art Gallery, Melbourne International Arts Festival, Whitechapel Gallery, and many more. In addition to being an artist, Biswas has taught fine art and art history at undergraduate and postgraduate level in the UK for over 30 years. She is currently reader in fine art at Manchester Metropolitan University and lives and works in London. Thanks, Shudapa Biswas. Thank you so much, um, uh, Danny, for the uh, introduction and um, also for your very uh, important and interesting uh, introduction to the day. Um, also, my thanks to uh, Arts on the London Underground for facilitating this event, which I think is a very you know, critical um, symposium, actually. Be interesting to see how things develop on from here. Um, I'm going to just uh, try to do a very speedy presentation today in some senses because I think that I'm going to be covering a f quite a lot of ground in terms of the images and the subject area that I'm trying to sort of open up for discussion and thought today. And um, <coughs> Uh, so uh, forgive me if I'm not able to focus specifically on uh, and spend time with specific images if you like I hope that in the breadth of them that perhaps what begins to emerge is a pattern of thought and a process of working that engages uh, my uh, uh, engages with and, and highlights my approach to um, making uh, visual works, making art um, through through the full length of it. Um, I'm just going to also mention that I've had flu this week, so I'm feeling a little bit gro uh, groggy. So you may need to bear with me a little bit on on that as well. Um, I'm going to start with my undergraduate study at uh, the University of Leeds, and. Um, I, was a st I was a student there from 1981 to 85, and uh, I arrived at, as an undergraduate student at a time when uh, it was really, for, in, in my opinion, uh, one of the most interesting and exciting fine art with art history, fine art and art history courses in the country. And it was uh, really at the forefront, I believe, of a lot of kind of rewriting and rethinking of 
uh, around the practice of art through um, through uh, the work of T.J. Clark, who set it up uh, as a department and brought in a number of very e extraordinary thinkers, writers, art historians, philosophers, really, to contribute to the structure of that course. And at its very heart, I guess, was a, an approach to thinking about or contextualizing practice within a frame that was very much steeped in a sort of Marxist, feminist, post-structuralist uh, critique of art and, and art history. And I was, in fact, the, I believe, the first person from the University of Leeds, the Department of Fine Art, to graduate in 1985. To the best of my knowledge, they had one... Uh, um, uh, black British student, uh, a South Asian uh, young man who had been enrolled onto that program pr pr previous to me, but who never, um, unfortunately, completed or graduated. So, I'm starting with Manet's Olympia, and one of the things that, as a student, uh, that really struck me at at the time, um, in the midst of this, you know, really, it was an incredible and extraordinary. A uh, privilege to uh, course and a privilege to be there, because one was exposed to a way of thinking about art practice and um, um, on all kinds of uh, of levels um, in a way that uh, was deeply engaging and highly critical, um, or highly analytical. You know, in terms of its approach to thinking about aesthetics in terms of thinking about the relationship between a work of art, the context of history, the context of socioeconomics, etc., etc. But ironically, within the nature, within the frame of this particular course, what struck me during a uh, particular um, studio quip with a fellow uh, student who was part of my cohort, a very uh, nice young man, um, was a glaring absence and it was an absence that for me from day one when I was a, stu a student of Griselda's that we Griselda and I were already engaging with um, an exchange really in terms of my asking her <laughs> more or less from the get-go you know but where are, where are all these other things you know where, why is there such an absence but it really hit home to me why um, this was such a, a key issue and a problem when um, my my fellow student was making a whole series of print works that were if you like looking at various um, key moments in in history during which um, uh, you know there were very iconic images that came out of very particular kinds of protests. So, for example, um, the Soweto riots, the uh, riots and protests of Gdansk, um, uh, you know, so on and so forth. And he, as his, as his final work in the series of these, you know, prints that he'd sort of uh, made and tried to sort of add text to, he worked with Manet's Olympia. And what he wanted to do was to somehow liberate Olympia from the frame of um, from the, the, the frame and the context of Manet's painting uh, of 1865. And what he thought he would do, or how he thought he would do this, was um, in in his way, in his own way, to offer a little speech bubble to the various uh, characters portrayed in this particular painting. So Olympia, I don't remember what the speech bubble might have said for Olympia, but so Olympia had a speech bubble and the cat at the foot of her bed had a speech bubble, but the black maidservant, Laura, had none. And it really su surprised me how somebody who could see what was happening in the Soweto riots, could understand what was happening in you know different parts of the world, could so sadly, abjectly, fail to see the black maidservant in the background. And so I had to go back, you know, I really had to think about this. And I had to, I went back to the writing and the kind of, the, the critical um, writing around Manet's Olympia that existed at the time. 
And I've already stated that I'm a fan of T.J. Clark, but what really occurred to me was that the reason that the student had failed to see Laura in this the context of this painting was because T.J. Clark, in his writings around Manet's Olympia, had himself failed to deal with the context and the dynamic of um, Lara's presence within the, the, the whole frame of the, of the painting. And so for me, it marked a very, um, a, a very important moment at which I felt it was really important to begin to interject into the canon of mainstream art history. And um, so in this work, Housewives with State Knives, um, I, I brought together iconography that came and fell outside of the Western uh, canon, if you like, but located it within the context and points of reference such as Rauschenberg's series of white paintings. So what you see here, and it is a very large-scale work, um, uh, what you see here is a um, are several is a is a is 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 a painting um, constructed out of several uh, pieces of paper that are, if you like, mounted onto canvas. Um, but the the reason that it was very important for me to place this. Um, forearm goddess, who at the time was really little known back in the 1980s within the sort of mainstream culture at, at all, um, was to place the forearm goddess Kali, um, who's um, a Hindu uh, uh, icon, if you like, um, in right in the centre frame of this painting, it coming if you like, exploding out of the whiteness of that space, which is a metaphor. Now, I was very interested at the time of making this work in, in, in reading um, the, the sort of critique, uh, art historical um, critique and feedback around, or responses to Rauschenberg's series of white paintings at the time that they were made, which struck me as very interesting because they talked about this, the temporality, if you like, of that series of works. In other words, a lot of people writing about that work spoke to the temporal nature of the shadows created as a consequence of light falling onto something, a, a work of art which essentially is um, white house paint on flat canvas. And this was very interesting to me because, and that's really why for, in the, in, in the context of this painting, I brought together fragments of, of paper that um, uh, that, that actually um, fold and crinkle and deteriorate over a period of, of time. Because what I wanted to say was what was visible to me in the shadows of that white metaphorical space was the black figure. Now, there is, no, um, there is no religious underpinning to this because for those of you who may perhaps know something about Hinduism, um, Hindus aren't supposed to eat beef, I do, um, and uh, I've, I've, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you a small story, I don't know how much time I have, but I'll tell you a short story. When this work was first exhibited at the ICA in London in 1985 in a show that was curated by Labena Himid called Thin Black Line, um, the Thin Black Line. Um, somebody at the ICA, well, so I shouldn't say that actually, I don't know if it was, but it seems it likely, um, somebody uh, managed to spit at this work. Um, and it was, it was hosted at the time in what was essentially the concourse gallery. So as you enter into the, the ICA, there's a, that narrow stretch. Now, somebody spat at it. And there was only one mark, and that mark was right between the eye. It's quite a tall painting, and it struck me that whoever spat at it was either an absolutely exceptional shot, or they'd been practicing. Either way, it said something about the context of the time at which 
this work was made and out of which this work was made, but also spoke to the context of the kind of response that this work garnered um, uh, f following its exhibition in, in a public venue. Now, several years later at the Neuberger Museum in uh, 2009, I believe it was, for an exhibition that was curated by Louise Yellen, um, I received correspondences and the museum, Neuberger Museum, received correspondences from um, the um, Hindu, Hindu Vata um, fascists saying that they were very offended by this work and that I wasn't a hin Hindu because Hindus don't eat beef and it's called Housewives with State Knives and how dare I and the m museum must remove it straight away. So what you have here is actually a very interesting set of, of, of um, opposites that are not opposite, actually they're, they're the same. So the work has actually, it seems to me, um, elicited a response from someone who you know, racists on the left and race, uh, I beg your pardon, racists on the right and racists on the right, extremists on, on, on both ends of the decade scale, basically. Um, I'm going to move forward um, a little bit, so that gives you a sense of the uh, structure of the work. So for me as an artist, and one of the things that is... Um, evident in the flag uh, over there to the left is this particular painter is a, is a small reproduction um, a small photocopy of this work by Artemisia Gentileschi and as a as a student as a feminist I was very interested in drawing um, common ground between myself and others who were responding to questions of patriarchy and looking at questions of feminism, what this actually meant in the context and practice of uh, art, art history, but also in the context of making, making art. I'm very limited in time, so I'm going to just whiz through this very as much as I can. Um, the background. Now, this is an image, um, an early image of... Asian women in, in the UK who were part of the um, Asia women's suffrage movement. But again, this is, um, th this is also an activity, or I suppose, or a kind of membership or presence and history that has been, if you like, whited out of history, unfortunately. Um, so as a young student, as an artist, I was responding to the context of various um, periods of protest hist historically that looked at the way in which uh, questions of uh, subjectivity in relation to race, um, gender and class were being addressed in the context of my own work but also in the context of um, uh, other people's work. Um, and uh, this is actually a very large work uh, kind of comparable in size to Housewives with State Knives, but I've, showing it here is an image on the front cover of Spare Rib, which I think it appeared in 1986-87, to again cite a, a particular sort of history that has existed, that again has uh, been very much engaged with questions around uh, protest and art and resistance. This is um, a photograph of... Um, Jayaben Desai, who uh, led, in many senses, um, the Grun Grunwick dispute, workers' rights, from 1976 to 78. Uh, born in Gujarat, Desai moved to Tan uh, Tanz uh, Tanzania in 1965, but was then expelled and arrived in Britain, where she took up low-paid work, first as a sewing machinist, then processing film in the Grunwick factory. She resigned after being ordered to work overtime and instigated a strike among the mainly Asian and female workforce. The strikers' protest about working conditions, pay inequality, uh, sorry, the strikers protested about working conditions, pay inequality, and institutionalized racism within the company. Desai led the strikers in their epic two-year uh, picket, um, and uh, she's reported to have had a very colorful way with words, and uh, there's a wonderful quote where, wherein she's uh, reported to have said um, to the boss uh, when she led the walkout, what you are running here, 
is not a factory, it's a zoo. But in a zoo, there are many types of animals. Some are monkeys who dance on your fingertips. Others are lions who can bite your head off. We are the lions, Mr. Manager, is what she said. Um, uh, and now I want to perhaps talk about, um, very briefly, the work of Howardina Pindle. Now, at the time that I was a student, um, outside of Frida Kahlo, there was nothing within, uh, the, um, within the curriculum that addressed questions of, of, um, uh, of uh, addressed the work of artists who were um, black, uh, people of color, um, non-white. And apart from Frida Kahlo's work, and so it's kind of interesting that I myself came, uh, discovered Howardina Pendle's work subsequent to my having graduated even. So again, what we're looking at is uh, Pendle um, came to the fore, if you like, or was very, very um, much active as, a, as, as an artist from the sort of um, 70s right through to the um, you know, contemporary period. But in terms of the kind of literature, in, ter in terms of the kind of information that existed around various artists, it was really very minimal. And the, again, I think this relates to some of the questions that um, Danny raised earlier on in his introduction. Um, I just want to play a snippet from it and to say, perhaps foreground that by saying the following. I'm going to also play something from my work in a short while. And what I think is interesting, um, how Adina Pendle is a black American artist, is the kind of comparisons that one can make in terms of things that, um, you know, in relation to the civil rights movement that was happening in the States, in, in India, in, um, in post-independent India, and also here. So really trying to sort of bring in lots of different levels of engagement around protests, around rethinking aesthetics, around rethinking language, and around making. Could I um, please have the, uh, Yanis? Okay. This is from uh, When I was in kindergarten, I Free had White a in 21, teacher who was not of black students. There were very few of us, possibly two, in the kindergarten class out of a class of perhaps 40. Uh, during the afternoon hours, we were given a time to sleep. Each of us had our own cot. And we were told that if we had to go to the bathroom, we should raise our hands, and one of the teachers would take us to the bathroom. I raised my hand, and my teacher flew into a rage, yelling, I can't stand these people, and took out sheets and tied me down to the bed. She left me there for a couple of hours. and then finally released me. One of the students filed a complaint, perhaps to a parent who did not know that I was black. Perhaps the child did not know or had not learned to differentiate race at that time. I later found out that that teacher was fired for bothering the student. Perhaps I was not the first one. Okay, if we could pause that there. Oh, actually, no, could you play it just for a little bit longer? Sorry. Uh. I went to a high school in Philadelphia, which was for girls, which emphasized academic achievement. Everyone was very competitive uh, with one another for grades. I did very well in the history classes and asked that my history teacher put me in the accelerated class. She told me she would be happy with my grades to put me in the accelerated level 
However, she felt that a white student with lower grades would go further, therefore she would not put me in the accelerated course. You know, you really must be paranoid. Those things never happened to me. I don't know anyone who's had those things happen to them. But then, of course, they're free white and 21, so they wouldn't have that kind of experience. I went to Boston University, and for my first year, I lived in a dormitory. Okay. I Thank you. Um, so, uh, I know I'm short on time. Um, so, that work by Pendle, um, if we could go back to the slides, please, um, is something that I came upon way after I was a, a, a student at either Leeds or at the Slade or at the RCA in, in truth um, and I don't know how much time I've got five minutes okay thank you um, uh, I don't know how much time I've got so maybe I may not be able to um, play actually could I have my DVD um, on because I think what's interesting is how, you know, as artists we will respond. If we, if you could play that, please. I think we need some volume. If we could stop it there, because I'm... Yanis, thank you so much. And then move back to the slide images, please. I'm going to just whistle-stop through it. I'm, I, I apologise. But what I think is um, important to, uh, to, to bring out is how, in different parts of the world, how individuals, um, black, uh, brown, POC individuals were having to contend with a history of imperialism and the kinds of fallout that existed from, from that. And so this particular work actually um, brings, it's a performance work that brings Griselda Pollock into this space. It was made whilst I was a student in 1984-85. And this, I have to say, also is was made, it's now part of the Tate collection, it was made before I'd actually met any other black British artists. So what was interesting, what is interesting is the fact that, you know, in different parts of the UK even, that artists were responding to the context of the socio-economic, historical and political times that we lived in. Um, I think I'm going to have to stop there actually, because I've reached my time, haven't I? Um, perhaps just to say, this work was made in uh, 2015 whilst I was um, Kashima artist in resident <laughs> in Japan and, um, uh, and was shown at the Beppu uh, Mixed Bathing World 2015 triannual. Uh, curated, uh, the Kashima residency was created by uh, was curated by Keith Whittle. So thanks, Keith, for for that. But it was again dealing with questions of identity, um, and it made at a time when we were so inundated with images of um, people, you know, dying in the Mediterranean as they tried to flee from war torn territories. Um, I'm going to just whiz through and show you these so that perhaps we can talk about them a little bit later. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your patience.
Yeah, sure. Let's do that first, uh, and then I'll yeah introduce you. Okay. Just introduce, introduce. Yeah, 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 that's okay. Um, thanks very much. I'd now like to introduce Anthony Faramelli, our second speaker on this first panel. Uh, Dr. Anthony Faramelli is a mental health recovery worker at the London charity Single Homeless Project and a visiting lecturer in film and screen studies at the University of Brighton. His research focuses on forms of indigenous resistance and institutional psychotherapy, specifically the therapeutic practices of Franz Fanon and Felix Guattari. He is the author of Resistance, Revolution and Fascism, Zapatismo and Assemblage Politics, which will be published by Bloomsbury Philosophy in 2018, and also editor of Spaces of Crisis and Critique, Heterotopies Beyond Foucault, which will also be published by Bloomsbury Philosophy in 2018. Thanks, Anthony. Thank you, Danny. And um, thank you for organizing what, what seems like it's going to be a quite remarkable day. And thanks to Art on the Underground for, for helping make this possible. What I want to do is something quite different than I normally do. You know, typically if I present it's at philosophy conferences or psychoanalysis, but I want to take a step back and con contextualize this in something that's quite personal for me. Mainly because the question, what should white culture do, is one that I have a very kind of, kind of particular relationship to. So to explain, let me tell you a bit more about who I am. I'm mixed race. However, I look white which means I ostensibly am white. I've been socialized as white. Um, also, I grew up in the city, not on a reservation. My ties to my Cherokee ancestry are further complicated by the fact that my mom is not full blood either. And the kind of neurotic American race system that qualifies your degree uh, of race, I'm exactly the bare minimum to still claim tribal benefits, although I've never registered with the tribe. I was born in Phoenix, Arizona, but raised in the suburb of South Scottsdale. I mean, you have to be really specific with if you're from North or South Scottsdale. Uh, the motto of Scottsdale is the westmost western town. H here we see an image um, as you enter into Old Town. The neighborhood I grew up in was sandwiched between what was known as Little Mexico to the east and the Salt River um, Pima Reservation to the east. I'm sorry, Little Mexico to the west, the Pima Reservation to the east. To be more precise, my childhood home is just a half mile south of Indian School Road. The school for which it was named, a constant and visceral reminder of the region's violent history of settler colonialism, didn't close until 1990. The city of Scottsdale is long and thin, and if you were to drive through it in the late 80s or early 90s, you would start in multicultural and working class south, and as you drive north, it would get progressively wider and progressively posher. The, the different, the residents between North and South Scottsdale did not get on. And in fact, it seemed to me as a child, the only thing that the Northern and Southern populations can agree on was that the Indians were a pain in the ass. As a kind of side note, e even the reservation I grew up next to has a quite funny history um, in terms of colonialism. So officially they're called the Pima people. It's the Pima reservation. However, their actual name is the Akamel Otum, so Akamel Otum, or the river people, is their name. But when the conquistadors came there and they you know, asked the quite sensible question, what nation are you from, they responded Pima. They responded Pima because the conquistadors were speaking Spanish, they'd never heard Spanish before, and Pima literally translates as, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, but, but nevertheless, that, that has maintained as their official name. You know, quite erasing, literally, their name from the history books. Now, the border dividing the city and the reservation is Pima Road. And the southbound lane of Pima Road belongs to Scottsdale. The northbound lane is Pima. To the west side, it was urban. Track housing, chain convenience stores, gas stations. The east side of the road was rural, cotton fields mostly. Scottsdale also leased pieces of the land for their community college and for a strip mall. Now, it'd be really easy for me to kind of draw on Edward Soya and Gloria and Zaluda and talk about how this was a third space where hybrid mestizo identities flourished, but that would be both wildly inaccurate and politically untenable. Spatially, Pima, Rep Pima Road represented a hard border that refused any kind of hybridity. Culturally, personally, I was never able to claim the kind of problematic celebration of mestizo identity, 
to be of mixed heritage in America, Native American and white, but look white is to be both a spy and a traitor. A spy because you get included in all the racist banter about the drunk and lazy Indians. A traitor because you know, even if you make no secret of your mixed heritage, you will always benefit from white privilege. Also, anecdotally, this always reminds me, um, before living in London, I lived in Czech Republic for a number of years. And when I lived in Prague, I once met um, an Otum woman at a bar. So she heard my accent and approached me and asked if I was part Indian because I have an Indian face. Um, we started talking about the way that native people are treated in Arizona versus the way they're treated in Europe. And she made a comment that will always haunt me. She said, I was lucky to have blue eyes because it meant that I never had to be treated like an Indian in Arizona. Um, so, so this is very much the kind of position that I'm speaking to you from. This kind of quite strange position of mixed race but white. And it's from this position that I want to use to interrogate not only what white culture is, but look at the relationship between settler colonialists in the Southwest and Native Americans, and how this relationship created a fetishized character of the good Indian you know, that's been exported to Europe through New Age cultures and um, you know, through, through kind of festival clothing and things like that. But first, let's talk about white culture. So in much the same way that Fanon pushed against the notion of negritude, the idea of a singular white culture needs to be critically assessed. Historically, white European cultures have largely defined themselves through conflict with one another. An overriding sense of white culture only exists through a negative relationship through the colonized world. As Edward Said demonstrated, this is a world divided along Manchinian lines of the Orient and the Occident. And a sense of white culture only exists as the binary opposite to the European fantasy of the Orient. As such, white culture can only be defined by its relationship with its fantasy Orient, its Oriental other. And far from being invisible when confronted with the other, white Europeans and North Americans are very aware of their whiteness. It becomes a shield they use to protect themselves from, from a fear of the unknown, from a fear of the savage Oriental other. Now, it's for this reason that the fundamental point of Alcoff's 1998 essay, What Should White People Do?, namely that white culture is necessary for a positive identity formation, absolutely must be rejected. Here, I'm closer to Zeus Leonardo, who argues that whiteness is not a culture, but a social construct, an amalgamation of different white ethnics into a single category for the purpose of racial domination on a global scale. Now this quote from Leonardo always reminds me of something that James Baldwin said and something that George Yancey also mentions. Once in an interview, James Baldwin famously stated that whites invented the nigger because they needed him. And the future of America depends on white folk answering the question, why do they need him? I would propose as a possible answer to that question that they needed the image of a dangerous savage to justify colonial and racial domination on a global scale. On another occasion, Baldwin turned the question of the so-called Negro problem back to his audience, quoting James Baldwin, if I am not a nigger, and it's true that your invention reveals you, then who is the nigger? But you still think, I gather, that the nigger is necessary. Well, it's unnecessary to me, so it must be necessary to you. And I give you your problem back. You're the nigger, baby, it isn't me. Now, in kind of classic psychoanalysis, the figure of the Occidental is, in Lacanian terms, a méconnaissé, a misunderstanding of the self that's structured by paranoid delusions, but yet essential to the functioning of the unconscious. So we can extrapolate from this that the figure of the savage Oriental is little more than a projection. Of course, colonial projects were brutal, bloodthirsty, uncivilized horrors, but the liberal imagination in white Europeans could not accept and cannot still accept this. So they had to transfer these horrors onto this fantasized other. In other words, white culture is a defensive misrecognition deployed to maintain the fantasy of civilization while actively pursuing savage projects of domination. As Fanon noted, quote, the collective unconscious is not dependent on cerebral heredity is the result of what I shall call an unreflected imposition of culture. So, very much drawn on Fanon, the problem here becomes one of recognition, but not recognition of the other in a Hegelian sense. Fanon already 
brilliantly demonstrated the inapplicability of Fanon's master-slave dialectic in the colonial context, but recognition of, or perhaps better to say, a coming to terms with their self. So this brings me to the Southwest, where I'm from, uh, native fantasy and aesthetic representation. Now, taking this understanding of white culture to, as my point of departure, we're better able to, be, to kind of critically assess the Southwest and the white population, um, their relationship with the indigenous other. In Arizona, the latter half of the 19th century was consumed with the so-called Indian Wars. Violence first started by miners and ranchers, but soon expanded to a sustained military campaign against indigenous peoples. Indeed, the region was so marked by conflict that General E.O.C. Ord remarked that war was the foundation of Arizona's economy and that the civilians demanded more troops because they wanted profits, not peace. By the end of the century, the U.S. military had fully conquered the Arizona Territory and a new influx of people came flocking to the southwest from the east coast. Now, while most of the white settlers in the Southwest wanted to completely exterminate the indigenous populations, Easterners, this is a quote from uh, the historian of Arizona, Easterners vacillated between the plowshare and the sword. They were more intrigued than hostile towards the indigenous populations. The first wave of East Coast immigrants coming to settle in the Southwest were health seekers. Fueled by Mesometic con conception of contagion, you know, that, that kind of Victorian idea that you get sick from vapors, you know, like rotting food and things like that make you sick. They believed that the region's dry and hot climate could cure any respiratory affections. The most notable of all these health seekers was an art critic, John C. Van Dyke. Van Dyke came to Arizona in 1898 with the hope that climate could cure his asthma. He traveled throughout the desert and fell in love with its aesthetics and published a book, subsequently published a book in 1903, very much detailing the desert's kind of color palette and its lines and silhouettes that you find there, titled simply The Desert. This was the first time that these kind of desert aesthetics became celebrated and helped push a kind of new wave of tourism forward. This was followed and worked in tandem then with the postcard and tourist ads that started appearing that branded Arizona, visually branded Arizona, by juxtaposing desert stills with cowboy and, Im cowboy and Indian imagery. Kind of, here's some examples of postcards from the time. This is early, 19th, um, early 1900s. The swastikas there uh, have nothing to do with Nazism. This was an Indian trading post on the Dane Nation, and swastikas are also quite common in Navajo um, culture. This is actually from the 1960s, but it's a perfect example of these kind of aesthetic branding. Now, it was right around this time that, that we started getting this kind of aesthetic branding and people coming as tourists to see you know, this kind of cowboy and Indian area that Fred Harvey began what he referred to as an anthropological tour company, where tourists can have, this is a quote, the ultimate encounter with their other. Painted Hopi uh, snake dancers would be scooping up rattlesnakes with their hands, dangling them from their mouths, and the dancers be became, quickly thereafter, the most publicized and written about Native American ritual in the Southwest. These tours introduced a generation of tourists to a region that seemed, quote, as exotic to most Americans as Africa. Now, working in tandem with these new tours, trading posts selling Indian artifacts spread across Arizona, as did festivals that cut and paste different indigenous practices together. But they took these practices wildly out of context and drained them of all their con um, cultural meaning. The most famous and extravagant was an esoteric society in Prescott called the Smoky People. They formed a structured and quite actually quite rigid belief system and a series of rituals through an odd bricolage of indigenous rituals and spirituality. Thomas Sheridan, who wrote the definitive history of Arizona, notes that these festivals were part of a larger phenomenon in the U.S. Quoting Sheridan, a growing, if often unconscious, dissatisfaction with American society during the Industrial Age that spawned dude ranches, Indian detours, and a host of fraternal orders with mystic rites and pseudo-esoteric folklore. Riding the range as a wild, free buckaroo was one response. Pretending to be a Pueblo Indian was quite another. The latter fantasy spoke to a need for social cohesion, religious ritual, and a rele re relevance for the earth. 
It did not matter that the smoky dancers were torn out of their cultural context or viewed by Native Americans with outrage and contempt. Plain cowboy or Indian was a reaction to the mundane materialism of modern life." End quote. In the end, however, far from finding a new non-materialist spiritual way of being, it was economics and the commodification of indigenous cultures that kept the smoky people and other local festivals going. National articles exclaiming, these are quotes, exquisite workmanship, harmonious color effects, yet always weird, inhuman, and grotesque, fantastic headdresses, gorgeous costumes, sun colors, bright feathers, beating tom-toms, haunted chants, fantastic serpents, thrilling. Different and as um, exquisite are these remarkable dancers. So these headlines brought in a steady stream of tourists from across the country, eager to see this kind of weird, fetishized, you know, spiritual Indian other. Now, while collecting cultural artifacts and anthropological tour companies were fairly common aspects of colonial empires, this was arguably the first time that white settlers adopted in mass faux indigenous practices and aesthetic representations. White settlers constructed a metronomic figure of the good Indian who can share his orientalist knowledge of nature with white folk so they can have a spiritual escape from the alienating world of modernity. This is a figure that has constantly been reincarnated since the 1920s and then subsequently exported to Europe through countless countercultures um, since the 1960s, really. Now, aesthetically, we see this figure in Southwestern art, especially in my hometown, you have the Gilbert Ortega galleries. So even there, they still have some signs that, that still note them as uh, fourth generation Indian traders. So the Gil Gilbert Ortega galleries are by far the most influential modern Indian trading post and gallery selling faux indigenous art. Once again, we see this fantasy of the good Indian who can open up a path to spirituality for white folk for companies in their about section on their Facebook page. To quote their about section, we are the original Gilbert Ortega Gallery, a nationally recognized dealer of Native American art and jewelry. We've been operating for the last 50 years, working hard to establish a reputable business with jewelry and art people can be proud of. Our business was started by the late Gilbert Ortega Sr. and is now owned and operated by Gilbert Jr. and his sister Gail, who view Native American art as an expression of spirituality. That, that's quite important. Native American art is an expression of spirituality. We have no, a knowledgeable staff with Native American history in mind that can help you find the perfect piece. With our prices ranging from $5 to $50,000, we have something for everyone. Come see what we've spent a lifetime learning. So for the low cost of only $5, you can buy spirituality. Um, now, this figure has definitely become the most persuasive, pervasive just north of where I'm from in the town of Sedona, the so-called New Age capital of the world. Um, a trip to Sedona is one of the most remarkable things you'll see. Um, it, it's one of the few places you can go and see in mass white folk wearing Sioux headdresses, talking about realigning their chakras during their Bikram yoga practices. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, vomit-inducing, really. <laughs> um, but funny enough, Sedona, Arizona, as detailed in a 2017 Guardian travel article, owns its sanctity to its Native American tribes and otherworldly nature. So it's, it's because they have you know, Native Americans from there that you, you have this spiritual epicenter. Indeed, Britain has been quick to adopt, adopt this metronomic figure. To find him, all you have to do is take a train to Brighton. Take a quick walk through the North Lanes and here we find the Two Feathers shop. <laughs> now, let, let me read you their about section for the Two Feathers shop. The owner's inspiration for Two Feathers came a few years prior to them opening the store. Traveling to the U.S., they started trading with Native American wares from market stalls and exhibitions before selling down roots in Brighton. Their travels have taken them to the far reaches of North America and down to the depths of the South. Time and dedication spent conferring and trading with many tribes from Native American artists and ceremonial leaders. Today, they hold one of the largest and most comprehensive collections of genuinely authentic Native American jewelry and artifacts, artifacts being misspelled, in the country. 
Two Feathers has been likened to a temple of all things native. Our intention has been to create a sacred place to house with integrity and honor the beautiful articles held within it, where people from all works of life can visit and learn about the original stewards of the land, and a place where spiritual in interests can be nurtured and grown as the many crystals, herbs, and other allies offer in service here. Two Feathers is a celebrated place where many collectors, artists, and ceremonial workers gathered and are inspired by its nature, a one of honesty, authenticity, and beauty. We look forward to serving you for many moons to come. Again, all you need to do is, you know, Fiverr, you're in. <laughs> you can buy your spirituality. In indeed, even on their about section, the picture of the owners that I chose not to show you is them hanging out in Sedona, obviously. Um... Of course, like all snake oil, the metronomy of the good Indian can't heal. It cannot guide white folk to a place of spiritual emancipation. The fantasy has been created as a commodity with no value other than its worth in the market. Beyond being a figure of pure colonial fantasy with no real connection to Native American cultures or beliefs, the good Indian is a placebo. No, it's not a placebo, it's a toxin. It's a toxin that's marketed and sold to white folk suffering capitalist ennui as a quick spiritual fix. So capitalism got you down, a fiver you can buy some good Native American spirituality as a way out. Now, what, what, what's our way out of this situation? Perhaps one is through a dialogical practice. Again, in classic Lacanian terms, you always desire what your other desires, but you never really know what your other desires, so you create a fantasy of their desire. In other words, you always desire a fantasy of your other. Now, this is precisely what the metronomic figure of the good Indian is, a white fantasy. Within this matrix, desires trapped within a circuit, and as a pure fantasy, it can never be fulfilled. Now, this is the classic description of what Felix Guattari termed a subjected group, a group that receives its determinations externally, forming paranoid delusions to protect it from any kind of outside anxiety. Conversely, a dialogical approach would work to undo this otherness while maintaining the recognition of difference. This approach would have the potential to create what Guattari termed a subject group, a group that is able to generate its own internal laws and, to, and projects in relation to other groups. So what would this look like in practice? One possible way to do this is by participation in social and cultural, social, cultural, political, especially political, mobilizations, as the one that recently happened in Standing Rock. Here, the standoff with the US is um, was contextualized in a manner that most commentators, especially, you know, kind of lefty white allies, totally missed. The indigenous resistance and other water protectors were very explicit that this was above and beyond all else a fight over the commons. It was about contesting ownership of water and land and promoting the notion that all people have the right to access free and clean water. However, most liberal white discourse in supporting Standing Rock focused only on recognizing treaty rights and respecting territorial sovereignty of tribal land. This turn to political recognition is not only a massive misinterpretation of what the confrontation was really about, but it also works against indigenous peoples, trapping them within the colonial system. In Red Skin, White Masks, Glenn Sean Cohard draws on Fanon to point out that, quote, colonial recognition politics can be summarized like this. When delegated exchanges of recognition occur, in real-world contexts of, of domination, the terms of accommodation usually end up being determined and the interests of the hegemonic partner in the relationship. So in other words, in a colonial situation, the idea of recognition will always fall to the master's, you know, the colonizer's, um, you know, benefit. You know, and I'm going to guess, how, how many are you kind of familiar with Hegel and the master slave? Not too many. So, so Hegel's idea of the dialectic of history, you have a master and slave that are constantly um, in conflict with one another, but the master needs the slave's recognition as much as the slave needs the master's. So, so it becomes a, process, a kind of mobile fluid process. Fanon pointed out that this doesn't work in the colonized situation because in the colonized world, the master doesn't want the slave's recognition. He wants his work. He wants the slaves to work. In fact, the master doesn't even recognize the slave as a human, so how can you have this dialectic work? In much the same way, 
political recognition of tribal rights does not benefit indigenous people because it locks them within a colonial system where they're trapped on the reservation. It always works to the colonizer's benefit. Now, in the colonial situation, colonized people develop, this is from Fanon, a psychoaffective attachment to the master-sanctioned forms of recognition. And this attachment is what maintains the kind of master-slave, colonizer, colonized relationship. In other words, arguing that the U.S. needs to respect sovereignty of tribal land and honor historic treaties, while well-intentioned, locks a struggle within a colonial context and blocks all avenues for a form of recognition that would work to undo this kind of dialectic. A dialogical approach would mean accepting the struggle in terms dictated by the resistance. It would have the potential to open up what Cothard terms a resurgent politics of recognition, an alternative politics of recognition that's less orientated towards attaining legal or political recognition by the state, and more about indigenous peoples empowering themselves through cultural practices of individual and collective self-fashioning that, that seek to prefigure radical alternatives to the structural and subjective dimensions of colonial power. All right, thanks. Um, sorry, just bear with us while we do that um, thing that always happens. Um, no, no one knows whose fault it is, but it's definitely the computers. <laughs> I, I don't. I think it's actually impossible to turn the aircon off. Um, uh, you'll have to ask the people that spent a million quid on the lecture theatre about that. Yeah, they didn't. Bit of a design flaw. before we do anything. Yeah. CSM, they're, they're kind of the LVMH room. That, that one tends to be, I mean, it's the usual. Imagine that it has a money to 
Okay, thanks for your patience. Um, I'd like to introduce Jade Montserrat. Um, Jade Montserrat lives and works in Scarborough, North Yorkshire. Montserrat works at the intersection of art and activism through drawing, painting, performance, film, installation, sculpture, print and text. The artist interrogates these mediums with the aim to expose gaps in our visual and linguistic habits. She graduated from the Courtauld Institute of Art in 2003 and Norwich University of the Arts in 2010. Now I've lost my page. Um, I can probably finish that out of memory. Um, she's also currently the Stuart Hall PhD scholar um, at the University of Central Lancashire. Central Lancashire. Um, thanks very much to Jade for coming. I hope you enjoy her talk. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, thank you, Sissipa. Thank you, Anthony. And dear friends, let us remember Glisson's words. Every time an individual or community attempts to define its place in it, even if this place is disputed, it helps blow the usual way of thinking off course, driving out the new, now weary rules of former classicisms, making new follow-throughs to chaos mon possible. Understanding that the question, what should white culture do, limits, negates responsibility and accountability through the word should, I will speak about iterations of the Rainbow Tribe project as a project that moves towards giving voice to a more democratic aesthetic, as an affectionate demand to address what will white culture have to do. I don't want you thinking that my being here as your white culture representative can alleviate the urgency of action. I want you to change the world. We need to start thinking exceptionally, as Stephanie Baptist said to me on Wednesday. First, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizens' councillor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate, who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal in, that you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by a mythical concept of time and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. That's Martin Luther King Jr., a letter from Birmingham Jail. Alcoff, in her article, What Should White People Do?, is clear suggesting there must be the will to make significant sacrifices toward the eradication of white privilege, adding, part of white privilege has been precisely white's ability to ignore the ways where white racial identity has benefited them. Sorry for talking so quickly, I've just got so much to say. <laughs> In accordance with that sentiment, Gina Diaz asserts that it will take a lot to awaken those that have feasted well on our hegemonic structures. What collective strategies might we implement in resistance to structural racism and oppression? Morgan Quaintance in his EFLUX article suggests refusal. How do we build to ensure our survival for, for refusal to work? In that case, we need to consider collective refusal towards a level of joy. So where are our allies? Sandro Mazadra suggests that refusal is the origin of any politi politics of transformation. The No Surprise Letter suggests that we are solid, galvanised feminists, but for the letter to impact our real and daily situations, we require real structural change, and that too has to be done collectively. Alcoff cites Gloria Joseph, who also argues that white women are both tools and benefactors of racism, and that feminists must recognise and address white women's social position as both oppressors and oppressed. I continue to operate under the normalised structures that that letter describes. I am reliant on my body being objectified in ways that blur the personal and professional environment to a point that my sanity is tested beyond limits. As Claudia Rankin poetically recognises in Citizen, the worst injury is feeling you don't belong so much to yourself, to you.
As Joseph Boyce pointed out, the next phase will involve the whole of mankind in the process of education. We require an overhaul of our national curriculum. I was sent a link yesterday to a petition calling for black history to be taught in schools. In contrast to the histories told by the victors, the histories that have been undermined, silenced and buried, these histories require unleashing, shaking out. I learnt nothing of our colonial and imperial histories at school. Richard Apaganesi posits, art history workshops should be programmed to acquaint the young with the culturally diverse knowledge production embedded in art history. We cannot stress enough how important it is begin to begin at the earliest age with a culturally inclusive view of society, with a wide horizon of knowledge and a basic philosophy that can embrace the world with open-minded wonder. This is not simply art appreciation, but a profoundly invested exercise in civic imagination. My school experiences were many and I was labelled a school refuser. From this outsider position, I could observe varying principles and ethos upheld by these guiding institutions. I could compare curricula in terms of their religiosity or moralising or absence of, but noticing what I later learnt was an ethics of conduct, conduct. I attended Methodist, High Church of England and secular private and public schools. Connecting the school experience was the isolating, exoticising fact of my presence. And whilst this could antagonise pupils and teachers through non-adherence to their systems of hierarchical categorisation and expected subordination that supported a sense of belonging through totalising taxonomies, there was never a condescension towards either placing my body within a history of imperialist expansion or a recognition of contemporary black lived realities. I live conveniently in a white bubble, the racialized legitima legitimation of Western civilization and the purported superiority of all things European. We require an overhaul of our art historical canon. Glisson notes in Poetics of Relation that standardization of taste is managed by the industrial powers. At Courtauld, where I studied art history, I was a self-proclaimed token, and the art history taught there skewered to the point of erasing anything other than a white male European perspective of history, allowed a personal disavowal of an identity that would have benefited from seeing and hearing from a multiplicity of voices. Instead, the course reinforced a fractured, vulnerable identity already indoctrinated by a white male gaze. We face the fact that our cultural and educational institutions are echo chambers for the white middle classes. Barbie Asante, I understand from reading Facebook the other day, describes culture as a weapon, stating that if it wasn't a weapon, we would all have access to it. Bell Hooks reinforces this in Black Looks. Control over images is central to the maintenance of any system of racial domination for black people, the pain of learning that we cannot control our images, how we see ourselves, if our vision is not decolonized, or how we are seen is so intense that it rends us, it rips us and tears at the seams of our efforts to construct self and ide identity. Often it leaves us ravaged by repressed rage, feeling weary, dispirited, and sometimes just plain, plain broken-hearted. These are the gaps in our psyche that are the spaces where mindless complicity, self-destructive rage, hatred and paralyzing despair enter. Griselda Pollock advocates a shift in the language promulgated within our cultural institutions and organizations and asks, why are we still merely correcting such radical imbalance with token additions? Do we need to grapple more profoundly with the structural racism and sexism of our culture and the way our cultural institutions performatively maintain whiteness and masculinity as norms? We require institutions, galleries, organisations, universities to embed care packages, including racial justice training, within their structures as standard, incorporating a code of conduct that with immediate effect brings about new equitable working environments, gender parity, racial equality, access. In a quote taken from Third Tech's Case for Diversity in Britain, it cannot be denied that art is embroiled in the culture industry shaped by the twinning of market forces and state policy, the very essence of neoliberal capitalism bonded to private public partnerships. Richard Apaganesi, again in the same document, goes on to say, artistic labour does not have a productive price that can be measured by an industrial art output of marketable goods with a per unit profit. The artist has no control on the market price of artworks, insanely high for some, little or nothing for others, because artworks are not strictly commodities. 
and the artist has no wage bargaining power that unions can use to negotiate with employers. Art has no use value in Marxist terms, but is a purely imaginary deposit of surplus value realisable only in cultural evolution, which reminds me to look at the organisation WAGE, a US model, the acronym standing for working artists in the greater economy. As anxiety takes a hold and we face an increase in violence, white supremacist re rhetoric, a patriarchy that won't let go, heads of state that don't recognise the humanity of difference, I'd like to quickly point out that the watercolour that is used to publicise the symposium called I'd Always Be Sure is of a white man who is haunted by the violence that ensued as a consequence of his educating at a youth camp organised by the Youth League of the Governing Social Democratic Labour Party. These are the eyes of the man whose lips are illustrated on the poster. On 22nd of January 2011, Anders Breivik massacred 77 people, mostly teenage socialists, on an island in Norway. His actions were the result of the political mainstreaming of pernicious racist and Islamophobic discourses. These watercolours are of surviving teacher Anders Pedersen. Um, I'm going to play this whilst I speak more. What else will white culture have to do? We require an emphasis on making clear and visible the circuits between energy source and our use of energy as we face environmental catastrophe. The earth is vulnerable. This performance to camera, filmed by Webb Ellis called Clay, is about humans gouging the earth humans being gouged from the earth, about rebuilding and the vulnerability we face in attempting to do this in isolation. What will white culture have to do? Listen and act on what it is hearing. My understanding is that our plurality, our shared responsibility, outweighs an emphasis on individualism that is a pervasive societal norm. I can recommend Rennie Edo Lodge's Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race, because it speaks clearly about the deflecting responsibility of structural oppression back onto the oppressed. This year I have worked with eight artists on a programme called Holding Space, where we come together every month for two days, where I began to expand my knowledge of colonial administrative processes, which this programme emphasises at, at its core. After each session, I re-entered my all-white spaces, including the semi-personal professional ones alluded to above, attempted to speak about decolonization, and I'm st subsequently still recovering from the explosions that ensued and the punishment that continues from speaking out about these taboo subjects. Rennie Edo Lodge thinks that it is quite easy for people to wriggle out of institutional racism because they're like, well, it's nothing to do with me. But structures really are made out of people. We are all participating in it. It's embedded in institutions and small organisations like our families and friendship groups and then reproduce, that then reproduce racism on a massive scale. What this book has the potential to do is allow reflection writ large. We must all share the politics of representation. The reason I love this book so much is that it speaks from a UK context. An enlightening conversation with Jack Tan made clear that our histories, our black British histories, are distinct from our African-American comrades. The worrying thing about the homogenization of American culture is that by attempting to challenge racism in the UK, by focusing on the African-American experience, we miss the particular British white racism and addressing it in a bespoke way. The risk is our whites adopting or performing US white racism. Our challenge is to look at our imperial history and the economic rationale for maintaining structural racism. Edo Lodge points out that the black British story is starved of oxygen, a story eclipsed, a deliberate attempt at keeping people ignorant about our colonial and imperial histories and the implications these have on culture and politics today. What this does to the subjugated is distort our sense of reality. I've spent all my life nine mi miles in this landscape here, west of Scarborough town, in a house with generated electricity, its own spring, gas lights, not a neighbour in sight. I came to live here through my mother's marriage to a local solicitor and country farmer whose family had bought the land without knowing the properties on it existed. The land was used by him and his brother, an international arms dealer, as a playground to blow and shoot shit up. Following divorce, my mother retained a house and attempts to maintain it as a sort of a home. 
It is an island amidst territory. For 23 years, I lived under the care of this man who had grown up on the outskirts of Leeds, completed his law degree at Leeds University and acted as duty solicitor at West Yorkshire Police. At the time that Jimmy Savile, also living in Scarborough and Leeds, was to the knowledge of the whole town in the case of Scarborough, allowed to abuse his status and was celebrated for it. I am the bastard child of dual heritage, not yet having met my biological father, who is incarcerated during my mother's pregnancy. My mother's ex-husband, who died last year, would reserve fearful stories of class, gender and racial marginalisation and inequalities for my ears alone. One of the haunting stories he would tell me uh, might be thought of as in parallel with Rashid Arun's For Olawali. I cite this work because these cultural histories, painfully memorialised through art making, need to be made centre stage. We need a soul of a nation from a British context. We need exhibitions by our British Museum, our British Library, our Tate Britain on imperial and colonial histories, the legacies cura curated by and focusing on those that speak from the margins. Back to the story. My mother's ex-husband would refer to a young black man who was taken to the cells at West Yorkshire Police Station whilst he was on duty. He described to me, always in private, how this young man, how this young black man was beaten fatally, with all traces of his arrest and death consequently erased. Whether this account was true or not remains contested. My idea, stemming from this story, is to create a collective work looking to the work of Rashid Arun and his ideas of fut futurity that envisions a collectivity inserting guerrilla memorialization, breaking down barriers of participation within an institutional context. Rather than attempting to uncover truths behind this violent image of black death and the very clear message that black lives are disposable implanted at a very early age, the idea is to discuss incarceration in its most expansive sense in terms of racism, imperialism and institutional domination, evasions, excuses and cover-ups, trauma and collective memory from personal experience and accounts and translating them into actions for innovation, creativity and productivity. How might the question posed by Stuart Hall from where does he or she speak expand the methodological role and function of culture? For Olawali is a four-panel work made after Irene learnt about the death of a Nigerian migrant, David Olawali, who drowned in the River Eyre in Leeds following continual police harassment. A subsequent criminal investigation resulted in the first ever police prosecution of British police officers in relation to the death of a black person. Today we must remember the very many Sarah Reeds and the relentless policing of our black communities. It is justice that turns memory into a project, and it is this same project of justice that gives the form of the future and the imperative to the duty of memory, Paul Ricoeur. One iteration of the Rainbow Tribe project, which began collaboratively with Rhea Hartley, is the Rainbow Tribe Affectionate Movement. The workshop was initiated by the exclusively online inquiry of what affectionate movement has the potential to be within existing systems and movements. An iteration that has branched off from this is a project entitled From a Creative Case to an Ecology of Care in collaboration with Daniela Valtz-Jen, Alberta Whittle, ne Noah Carjaval and Nicholas T. Following these uh, three public facing outcomes to this research in practice project, what has been highlighted are the difficulties in establishing dialogues when the go-to discourse is highly individualized. We feel an imperative to center care and are currently navigating the difficulties around that while holding the complexities that we face as artists making work. The Umbrella Project's title, The Rainbow Tribe, is taken from Josephine Baker's pivotal 20th century experiment, The Rainbow Tribe, in which a group of 12 ethnically diverse children were adopted by Baker. The project explores Baker's fairy tale like ideas of a modern mixed-race family in the climate of global 20th first century issues surrounding cultural diversity and political freedom within the context of the imperial movement. Anne Anleng Chang argues the Rainbow Tribe as a collection of children of different races teeters uneasily between a bold dream of diversity and disquieting repetition of imperial desire. Baker's family experiment was her flawed solution to a global problem, how to transcend race. 
This liberal gesture, as identified by Cheng, for both Baker and since, is not free from imperialist desires. The Rainbow Tribe project defines itself as a cultural mix of people who are advocates of free movement. The Rainbow Tribe project questions our collective agency, responsibility and commitment as global participants on a worldwide stage. My art practice explores how Baker was appropriated by oppressors as a racialized symbol to serve a paternalistic agenda of apparent sympathy with the plight of the oppressed. The theoretical model developed by Glisson through uh, I'll go back to this. Uh, maybe I'm not quite sure. Oh, oh, I've got it. Thanks. Um, yeah, through his analysis of the way in which Nelson Mandela was appropriated, situates Baker as a hero in Glisson's terms, an echo monde in Western discourses, likewise, therefore, symbolizing the causes of oppressive powers. Oppressive powers know this very well and attempt, attempt to incite heroes, whether real or mythic, to symbolise their causes. Thus there appear pseudo echomond which Western opinion has apparently become expert at creating. Baker's work was thus admired and applauded by the Perron regime and the French resistance. Notwithstanding, Baker emerged from colonial and segregation contexts, utilised her celebrity status for humanitarian needs, and was subsequently courted by the civil rights movement, my initial research on Josephine Baker included inquiry into the balance between how she enabled control of her body and persona, the representations and possible manipulations of her body, and an unapologetic quest for equality and freedom. I've developed a personal interest in Baker as a dislocated, self-styled woman longing to make sense of the constructs under which she was born. As a post-colonial subject working from a North Yorkshire town, I can draw from a fractured and erased biography, perpetually attempting to define place in community, shaped by experience of cultural violence, nationalistic chauvinism, racism and xenophobia, coercion and rejection. Fun times. <laughs> <laughs> Dion Brand captures this liminal, fractured, disjointed space, which also serves to question cultural values, expectations and limitations. To live in the black diaspora, I think, is to live as a fiction, a creation of empires and also self-creation. It is to be living inside and outside of herself. It is to apprehend the sign one makes, yet be unable to escape it, except in radiant moments of ordinariness, made like art. The North Yorkshire rural landscape is, I understand, one scarred by borders. A testimony to territorial ownership, yet I seek sanctuary within it. The project instigates conversations through practice from this personal understanding of the North Yorkshire rural landscape and from my indeterminate history of migration stemming from my Irish and Welsh, Chinese and Montserratian ancestry. The aims of creative work issuing from the Rainbow Tribe lead to investigating the idea of choreographed bodies and bodies in movement, ownership, representations and manipulations of the body, equality and freedom of expression, speech, movement, to actively participate as community, recalling and exploring through creative practice. And this quotation, again by Glisson, articulates this possibility. This movement allows giving on and with the dialectic among us aesthetics. My praxis is radical praxis, which hopes to echo Josephine Baker's radical praxis. The project straddles, straddles the thresholds of race, class, gender and globalisation recognising that these elements are all in constant movement and flux. The Rainbow Tribe project can respond to the one, my one, point in time, again recognising that all is in flux. My job as a creative practitioner is to feel it, research it and present it. The Rainbow Tribe project is an exchange between the Black Atlantic, Black Diaspora and the North of England and the liminal space that I operate in creatively. We might think of Josephine Baker's Rainbow Tribe as an orphanage, and by extension, through this contemporary project, Black Britain as an orphan group. Where is my, and by implication, where is the other bodies, othered bodies, space and place? As Stuart Hall notes, identity is not in the past to be found, but in the future to be constructed. What should white culture do? 
Be ready to construct existing identities anew and create structures that centre the celebration, care, warmth and real understanding of difference. In the words of Malcolm X, we have to change our own mind. We've got to change our own minds about each other. We have to see each other with new eyes. We have to come together with warmth. And I think I've got um, time to play you a, a work that I made, which is technically no good and it's not finished, but it's called Warmth Value, so it makes sense. Thank you. she knew, inside. This, she still feels, is contained in her body. She was commanding the winds with her arms, beckoning them to emerge with urgency and a terrible pressure. The winds approached tenderly. This tenderness was something she didn't know and didn't want, a refusal. She wanted ownership. She wanted what she wanted, a humane weapon to hunt her down and grapple with her, to the point of intuitive communion. She had hoped for force, reflecting something of her own nature and relation. Force she did understand and feel, her always impossible, malignant force. She would have liked to have been floored, toppled by the wind, that great dust that she came to love so much in the painting by Michael Andrews. Michael Andrews's paintings, whose work she came to through a trance encounter, and, as with all treasured trance encounters, she met with him, with them, alone. That, she later reflected, was why she wanted the gust, and the unexpected, but invited, and the surrender to something bigger than herself, something she had thought she could never defy or rebel against, something unformed, untainted by man and his rules. Man did taint, despite her suspended belief, and him exposing himself again and again, and her giggling nervously and blocking the memory, her coming to terms with that still trips her up. Taking the liberty of gendering capitalism, gendering capitalism as he, man is really dragging us into environmental catastrophe. And quoting Mark Fisher, the significance of green critiques is that they suggest that, far from being the only viable political economic system, capitalism is in fact primed to destroy the human environment. The relationship between capitalism and eco-disaster is neither coincidental nor accidental. Capital's need of a constantly expanding market, its growth fetish, means that capitalism is by its very nature opposed to any notion of sustainability. Her body convulses against indoctrination. Midway between then and now, between the speaking to the wind and the hope for a surrender, around the time she'd wander and watch David Blunkett and wonder in town, not making the connections between him and what was revealed to her later as the political party conference. She'd seen a man push against the winds, pushing, pushing, almost horizontal, on St. Nicholas Cliff, the exact place she'd seen Blunkett. A year or two ago, the winds picked up a frail lady a couple of feet off the ground and plumped her down, gently mind, prone. I offered to hold her bag as she lay on the floor, confused and frightened, but the lady became anxious and couldn't trust. The six-year-old golden girl was her own protectorate in costume. Forever in costume, a set designer, paradoxically, a submissive, mosquito-bitten chieftain to her partner's territorial grip. <laughs> 
He introduced the golden girl's body as fiction, a geographically defined object. In his sights, he said her head balanced on a swan's neck. Lucky. What could he mean that they'd locked her in the coal house? And why did the other men laugh? She wore jodhpurs. She was atopic. She wore a flat cap. To the left of the house she lived in, the house that only just allowed a roof, there's something approaching what we've come to know as a roof, but it was pierced, the gaps soaked, the house that was rotten from the inside, rising and dripping damp. To the left of this house was her man-made bank. The bank was hers because she stood atop and felt her reciprocity. Her frame saw the bank as another land, far enough, close enough from, to, the house, to surrender with her body to the imagination of other worlds and magic. The bank, hers and holy, a fantasy. Surrounded by her claim as she was, she was getting to grip with the evocations. Her claim, neither birthright nor legacy, but a landscape she'd inadvertently staked a claim in indefinite belonging. Her nature desired oneness with herself and surroundings, and that, that she fought tirelessly for. She'd later understand this as hosting herself, as being with and in herself in unity beyond consciousness, in an absence of language, a coming together with the universal, Not with collecting, warmth. dispersing. Her body, threatening presence, Later, although she prefers history, not age, was mistaken for a roe deer making a way through a half-light canopy. The cowboy, his thirsty loaded gun, shot at her. He missed. She'd seen Jesus, Jesus bids her shine afterwards through pass like that took her past where he'd marked her out. They shot down the predator. That's one less shot for me. They have shot down the predator, and it fills my heart with glee. stage. Um, there's now an opportunity for a panel discussion, so I'd like to invite Anthony Faramelli, Shtapa Biswas and Jade Montserrat up to the stage. It's also my great pleasure to introduce to you artist and writer Sunil Shah, who will chair the discussion. Um, thank you, Danny. Um, I think uh, we can all agree that three really um, powerful presentations there, and so much to so much to ask you about them. Um, I, I'm almost of loss of words. But um, uh, when when I heard of this uh, symposium, um, the first thing I thought of was that the the the, the title itself was um, I found um, provocative quite open, but also um, one that difficult to find my own kind of relationship to, um, because initially I thought to myself, well, I, I'm part of white culture as well. Um, and it got me thinking about the kind of a certain degree of, of how my own life has been kind of normalized to think in, in terms of whiteness. Um, you know, from a very early stage of my life, uh, being told to play the white man at school and things like that have kind of led to certain ways of thinking 
and to not confront even, to, to get to a stage where to confront seems to be wrong in some way, to, 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 to even frame anything in that way. So what I wanted to ask initially um, was that obviously with Jade and um, Sutapa, your um, you know, artistic subjectivity has uh, a certain way to kind of negotiate these issues. Um, and of course, Anthony, uh, come in at any point. But how did you how did you come to frame this question yourself um, for this symposium? And Sotapa? Um, well, it was very difficult, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, to try to um, think about the title and then wonder at wonder in 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 what way to respond to the needs of, in terms of the changes that need to be addressed and made. And I think that that's been very well articulated actually, directly and indirectly by all three of us in terms of um, the kinds of discourses we're very much absorbed in. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I was a student at, at the Royal College and, uh, my supervisor at the time, the, the staff who dealt with me were fantastic, but I also have to say that it's, you know, the Royal College of Art is, I don't know if you have any, you know, artists uh, or, or academics who are not white, you know, teaching here anymore. And so, th you know, this this whole concept even in terms of having the day here was important, is hugely important, but nevertheless raises so many different questions. So, um, but then I, I, I felt, so, so in a way one, one can deal with the kind of institutional complexities of trying to uh, open up discourses within the, the, the context of a place such as the RCA. But at, and at the same time, think well actually um, y you know maybe I can talk from example of how from a personal perspective one affected change the thing I should say about my experience in in Leeds was that actually after I challenged Griselda and other staff there by by that time TJ Clark has left had left and he has in fact revised his writing around Manet's Olympia to to address some of the things that he so clearly failed to see in the first instance um, but it is interesting that Griselda certainly and uh, led uh, structural changes within the course curricula at Leeds following my very long you know uh, relationship and friendship with with her um, so I felt that that was relevant to bring up in the context of today. But in terms of, of, of practice, I think that for, for me, one of the problems as an artist who came out of the 80s at a time when um, art criticism really failed to look beyond the surface of what, it, of what the work was about, it was very problematic for me because I came from a background that was very much entrenched entrenched in a critical discourse that, you know, it, it w was Marxist, feminist, post-structuralist and worked with deconstruction as a methodology by which you begin to think about the aesthetic, about aesthetics in a way that contextualizes your practice socially, politically, historically, economically. So, on, you know, to always be reduced from the 80s in terms of the kind of critiques that existed at that time in terms of one's practice in a way that was always just about blackness, whatever that meant, you know, in their eyes. You know, Valdemar Janicek's um, uh, review of Thin Black Lines was Anger at Hand, and it included a work of Housewives with State Knives. And I think, you know, in late subsequent reviews by him of my work was, I think, indicated a real a fear on his part to actually deal with the, the, the history of aesthetics that I was bringing to the fore. So it was not just about his, his racism uh, 
in truth. Um, it was also about his, his, his sexism. You know, he failed to actually deal with those kinds of things. I hope he's different now. <laughs> 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 Who knows? I don't know. Uh, but I, I, having said that, I heard, a, a, you know, a, 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 an art programme that he did, he, he kind of put together... Um, directed not very long ago and I was horrified at the way in which he was uh, speaking about um, Leonora Carrington's work and it was more or less his attitude was still oh if I don't understand it I'm leaving it over there you know which is 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 just appalling you know let's just not make any excuses for it anymore um, so I was trying to bring today a, a, a way of looking into how as art as an artist I've been able to sort of interject into the kind of structural the sort of systems that exist and how you know uh, I'm I could talk about this in in, in, in in relation to my personal experience of trying to open up those spaces um, my my engagement as a practicing artist is is very much led by my my fascination and love of art history although I didn't talk about it earlier on but a word a work birdsong and magnesium bird which is is something that centers around a, a work of art by Stubbs um, Lord Albemarle and um, Holland shooting at Goodwood um, in which the black male servant is tending to the horses while his masters are at play. I think it's 1759 that was made. And it was the same year, interestingly, that the Capability Brown laid the foundation stones of Harwood House uh, when he was landscaping the gardens there. And Magnesium Bird, of course, was made at uh, Harwood House. So in terms of how I, as an artist, have tried to open up those spaces, it's really to kind of pull apart the aesthetics of of you know various art historical works and to begin to somehow interject into those narratives and completely turn them over where, where one can. Sorry, I've given a long <laughs> <laughs> no. um, And your thoughts, Jane? Um, well, I think the, the question was um, how I came to... Yeah, I mean, I, I, I know... I, and seeing your Facebook post as well, saying that when confronted with that question, yeah. there was a lot more to unpack yeah. than meets the eye initially. Sure. Yeah, um, I think that I tried to have conversations um, about it, um, and it sort of. Um, I, I can only come from my perspective and the work that I make um, and that's one of fear and one of rage um, and then it was kind of compounded by the conversations that I was having saying I was going to be speaking at um, a symposium called What Should White Culture Do and that the um, I've had varying responses, so um, from you should be making not getting up on your soapbox to um, being instrumentalised to, well, I've been to um, talks or equivalent symposium, symposia, um, and it hasn't made any change so it's you, like I was an optimist last year <laughs> 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 um, so that's how I, I would you like to add anything Anthony to that sure um, <clears throat> how, how I approach this, this question yeah yeah Columbus Day, I guess. <laughs> um, I mean, when when Danny first told me about this, uh, I, I had this kind of weird memory because um, if you didn't guess from my my surname, my pop's Italian, uh, which always led to arguments on Columbus Day. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, because you know he 
I, I used to, you know, you know, being, being the, the kind of revolutionary punk rocker I was, um, demand to go to school on Columbus Day when they gave us the day off because I would not take a day off that celebrated the genocide of my people. Um, and then, of course, my father would remind me that, you know, I'm more Italian than I am Cherokee. <laughs> um, and it's not really about Native American genocide, it's about Italian pride. And, and this was a, a argument that never quite got resolved. Um, and, and this idea of approaching it through rage is something, you know, I, I think a lot of, it's always the elephant in the closet, isn't it? Like when I was doing my mental health training, um, you know, of course it was mostly white. Um, and, and rage and anger was always the one thing that they, you know, like, like when you're in, because my background is in group analysis, so it's not one-on-one -on -one therapy, it's group therapy, right? And, and you have to be in therapy to be a therapist. I'm, I'm still not finished with my qualification, but, um, but the group was predominantly white, and, and rage was always the hardest thing that they had to talk about. And when I would talk about how angry I got things like, you know, like Brexit or how angry Columbus Day really made me or how angry I got when I saw white folk talking about realigning the chakras with Sioux headdresses on, you know, that, like th th for me this is really, ha has an immediate affective reaction. That was always quite scary to, to the group. You know, whenever I kind of started talking about how really fucking pissed off I was about something. Um, so, so that's, I suppose, how I approached it. And, and certainly in my therapeutic practice, that's, you know, how, how do you sit with rage? Or, or how do you work through rage? You know, in, in any therapist's practice, that's the first question that you have to really think through. So that was very much, you know, in, in many ways, my, my paper was, you know, can, can be summed up with, you know, let, let me tell you about some things that pissed me off. <laughs> um, you know, so, so, which in, in and of itself is therapeutic, but that of course can't be where it stops. Of course, and uh, I mean, I one thing I did want to uh, touch on uh, was something you mentioned was um, being locked into a colonial context. And mm. to, for me, certainly, I think sometimes of the art apparatus or working within that sort of artistic institutions as being a kind of mirror of this kind of uh, uh, colonial context, which in which. Uh, uh, there's a there's a need to break out of you know whether it's kind of multiculturalism or diversity policies or any of those things. Um, so I was interested in what you said around subject group and you know um, Sutapa you mentioned Grunwick um, and you know to break out of this and uh, Jade you said you said you know a, an order that's devoted uh, so di uh, um, a system that's devoted to order and um, as opposed to justice so. Uh, I can see that this, you know, there, need, there is this sort of sense that we need to break out of this, this anger needs to have some sort of output. Um, and so there are these set of institutional structural barriers. So how do we hurdle those barriers and how, um, you know, how, how do we go beyond, um, you know, what, what we see as being kind of everywhere in terms of like things stopping us to sort of move beyond? I don't know if there's any clear or straightforward answer to that. I think that, you know, I think collective organisation is really key. And I think it's marvellous that this day has been put together. And I think it's fabulous that you're here, Jade. And, you know, uh, it's not really a soapbox, I don't believe. Because I think that, for me, you know, that kind of... It, it, the process of engagement is actually what's what's key to making change, but in my opinion, and um, you know, I think that in looking at various case histories, and there are just so many. You know, in terms of sometimes you you don't know where to start because it's so extensive and it's so extraordinary. You know, the tentacles are you know are everywhere in that sense but I do think that um, and I think also you mentioned I think you, if I'm not mistaken JJ you kind of referred to it or kind of made a suggestion around it uh, which is that you know uh, and within that there are various things operating that that 
in a way, censor and erase ourselves. And it is bound up to capitalism and neoliberalism and how neoliberalism is still on a project to erase. And I think that in terms of, you know, our collective efforts to try to to circumvent, circumnavigate that and still end up working together, you know, and forming, you know, strategies of engagement, strategy, strategies of, of change are constantly being undermined and underpinned by near, near, neoliberal sort of procedures, whether it's in an institutional and educational context like this or in a museum gallery context whereby, you know, this age-old divide and rule it's alive and kicking, basically. And, you know, there are certain key players within that, you know, system. That, and I think Morgan Quaintance talks about this, doesn't he? You know, the system of award, if you like, you know, the honours system, for example, that says, OK, well, you're all right, you're safe somehow. And that in itself creates a particular kind of vortex, I think, which is is problematic, actually. But at the same time, it's hard to you know to separate what that vortex is from the power nevertheless of individuals who can find themselves caught in that vortex of the nature of their of, of their practice you know John Acumfer Isaac Julian Sonia Boyce Lebena Himid these are all people and probably others I've Yinka are all people who've accepted honors now for me that's really problematic on a personal level, it's their choice. But nevertheless, you know, we can't underestimate the value and the power of the work that they make. And so, you know, there's a there's an endless battleground here in terms of, you know, st- how strategies are co-opted. And I think we do have to go back to that great imperial moment of what you know, divide it and rule. You know, what what creating, you know, Balfour Treaty <laughs> is just. You, you know, the centenary has just just happened. You know, how what is the impact of all of these of these territories being carved up, and how are how is agency within it? You know, within the the neoliberal and worse system, uh, how does it function to kind of con- to, to keep that alive? Um, and how outside of that we you know somehow manage to 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 work with it and around it it's yeah I mean I'm with Jade on that one you know when you say last year I was an op- optimist <laughs> <laughs> but I still am actually I think we have to be and I think what's very exciting nevertheless irrespective of all this is and that's why the education system is under such aggressive um, corrosion you know by this neoliberal and far-right wing system in the sense that the students are fantastic, you know, our students are just, you know, they're just out there, you know, they're just doing it basically, and, you know, that that I think is is a great place of hope. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I shouldn't say it too loudly because now we'll get chopped back even further, <laughs> more aggressively. But you can't keep you can't keep you, those things back. I don't think there will be other ways and other means of. Of, of, of carrying that through and there is change it's not enough it's not enough you know Lebena Hemed has been nominated for the Turner Prize decades you know after she should have been and she probably won't get be you know win the Turner Prize because they'll give it to Rosalind Na- Nasab- Nashabishi or something you know because X Y and Z who knows you know uh, who knows who's listening really but you know, all these terrible things need to be addressed and seen in within the context of a bigger picture. Um, I don't even know how to follow that. <laughs> um, I mean, ways out of this kind of subjected group formation. It, it's hard for me not to discuss this without kind of falling back on my, my academic practice. Um, a lot of my work, uh, I think as Danny mentioned, I'm, I'm quite interested in the therapeutic practice of Fanon. But, but more generally, I'm interested, I'm interested in institutional psychotherapy, which was a very kind of specific, or is really, a specific thing that happened in, in post-war France. So you had this kind of 
network of psychiatric hospitals and clinics um, formed that, that were informed, you know, their therapeutic practice was informed <laughs> by their experience um, of the war and, and their experience of being part of the resistance. So, so you had this kind of strange moment, very, very brief moment in saint norban outside of Lyon, where you had Francois Tosquet, Jean Uri, Franz Fanon, and Felix Guattari all there working at the, at the same time. And um, that's where this kind of movement started. So, so, so you see these kind of trajectories you know, move out the way Fanon went to first uh, British Jonasville and then Tunisia, where he did, in, in my opinion, some of the most interesting work of the movement. Um, Labor then being the famous example with Uri, Polak, and Guattari. And, and, and Labor is still up and running, right? But, but there was something really interesting um, you know, that, that you can kind of read through all these different practices, you know, therapeutic practices. And that was this kind of notion of resistance. Um, at, at its kind of political and social level. Um, you know, famously, Tosque and Fanon refer to this as social therapy. It's not psychotherapy. And, and Fanon had a really good way into this. Um, you, you know, the, the kind of psychoanalytic tradition that says that there's no such thing as mental health. We're all fundamentally neurotic, right? So, so it's not about curing someone. It's about adjusting their neurosis to fit society's neurosis. And then Fanon was like, well, as a, as a black man, if the societal neurosis is racism, why do I want to adjust um, you know, to fit into this? You know, therefore, how, how do you cure neurosis? Well, you fucking fight racism. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it becomes a political like, impotence there that you, you have to, you know, you have, if you don't fight for structural change, that, then the, the kind of conditions of poor mental health remain very much intact. Um, so, so, you know, the cure becomes political. It becomes about societal transformation. And, and there's kind of interesting projects of, of, you know, this kind of affirmative resistance that, that you can map on today. You know, um, one, one of the areas I specialize in is indigenous resistance in Southeast Mexico, you know, the, the Zapatistas. And, and the way that they're kind of, kind of taking this dialogical process, you know, um, a process that, that in, in you know, my, my thinking is, is basically group therapy. And, you know, and the way that they kind of organize themselves, you know, to, to move very slowly. Um, and, and there's a certain, you know, like, like what you're saying, that the temporality of, of the Rauschenberg white, you know, but it's a resistance to a certain temporality, right? Um, you know, th this resistance to kind of going fast, to just pushing through. You know, to have this, you know, like, like as Danny said, to have this kind of white whirlwind with a hollow center, it, it's an absolute resistance to that. And, you know, slow down, slow down, go slowly, and resist at every single step. You know, it, it ain't real sexy, you know. Um, it, it doesn't have the kind of great, kind of Jacobian, like, run to the battle. You know, it doesn't have that kind of sexy, revolutionary push to it, but it's sustainable. And, and it's a practice of resistance that works to undo this. Um, and uh, you picked up on this um, quite a bit, I thought, because um, you, you were talking about a kind of collective, joyful, affirmative refusal, you know, like, you know, like, I refuse not to, or, or the, the way that, because resistance and refusal are really problematic because they can either be like resentment, you know, it could be um, reactionary. You know, so, so then how do you conceptualize this and you know, they kind of almost Nietzschean affirmation. Like, I refuse to take part in this. I refuse to do this. I, and by by saying I refuse to do that, you're kind of actively thinking of ways you have to. The alternative. Yeah. Yeah. But the, I think that the refusal can only come after you've established what the alternatives are, because mm. that's where that that's where your precarity. So a refusal can be that you're no longer. Um, uh, trying to understand the neurosis as a, a, a consequence of the societal neurosis, or however you put it, much more succinctly, but um, uh, that you can um, have strategies for self care, mm. which would incorporate group therapy, and that there are new structures that. Um, 
<coughs> that complements the accountability that we can show ourselves. Mm -hmm. But I think that the refusal can only come once we've established that we're sort of together, mm -hmm. um, because that's where the fear comes in. Mm -hmm. Like, w you can refuse to stay silent, but how do you know that you're protected? Or h however, you know, you can refuse to operate under certain exhibiting conditions, but how do you know that you're going to be able to sustain yourself? Or, you know, all of these th things, like... It's having the alternatives ready, and mm -hmm. I think that that can only be done collectively. Thank you, Jade. Um, uh, I'm not sure whether we're done for time or whether we can open it out for a few questions. Um, we've got some mics here. Yeah, it did, um, absolutely. Um, if you could wait for the mic to reach you um, before speaking. Um, is there any questions? I'm going to take a photograph of the audience. There's one just there. Hi, thank you so much for the talk. Um, I'm a student at the Royal College of Art, so I have to say that this is the first time that um, I think we broke records, at least from the last year I was here, to see people of this much people of color in the same room and having the chance to talk about this. Um, again, um, I think it's a bit problematic. I have to share my experience because it's a bit counterintuitive that um, people like me come from the other part of the world, I'm Arab, and being here is still part of an imperial legacy where our narrative is almost absent in this kind of education um, uh, institution. Uh, but yet again, um, I feel we're always speaking about this problem of race from the same uh, framework, and I don't know if there's other forms of agency or resistance that can come from outside. Uh, because it's always, we're still talk. even the question for me is problematic, to be honest, because we're still defining race from a white <laughs> perspective or a reaction or a definition of white man or white culture. And yeah, that's my, if there is um, other forms that could come from the outside, like instead of this um, dialect or even people like, the talk about um, like Edward Said and others, they're still, they were very purely educated in the West and that's the only reason I think that they were heard. And all of us here, we have this chance to talk about this because we're still embodying the same kind of framework. And even if I try to argue this in my thesis, all my um, um, references had to be Western and I still find this very hard to break away from when we're trying to talk about race. And It's quite funny. Um, I, I write a bit for a French journal, Chemin. Um, it, it's a journal that was started by Deleuze and Guattari um, quite a while ago. But they recently did a, a special issue on Edward Glissant. And <clears throat> they, they approached me to write a, a piece specifically putting Fanon and Glissant in conversation. And the reason why they approached me was they, they didn't know any other Fanon scholars. Um, which seems weird, but, but it's because you don't read Fanon in France. You know, like, like he dared question the French legitimacy of colonial rule and colonial empire. So even though he was very much a product of a French educational system, um, he's still quite, you know, like, you know, somehow people still kind of pass him by in the French philosophic kind of thinking. Um, so, so it was, you know, when Chimer approached me, you know, I'm, I'm by far not, certainly not the most published person <laughs> who writes on Fanon, you know, not, not, by, not by a million years. Um, but since I, I already work for them, they're like, well, we don't have any other French affiliations who, who work on Fanon. So you're, you're absolutely correct that one of the things that has to be pushed, um, not, not just here, but definitely here, but, but across a kind of European and North American framework, is what is the syllabus? Um, yeah, I, I, Danny mentioned this as well. You know, you might get like the, the kind of token week 12 lecture. This is race. You know, let, let's talk about 
um, era of this talk about South Asian African um, philosophies, you know, in, in one kind of condensed 90 minute, one hour lecture, and then you move on to, but really it's all about Hegel. Um, so, so you're absolutely right. You know, it has to be something that is actively resisted internally, as well as looking outside for, for what other kind of discourses we can bring in. Any other questions? And sometimes I think the problem with that is that the people who, you know, for example, there's a, a conference in um, in Europe shortly um, that's in 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 a Southeast Asian South Asian context is trying to uh, address some of these kinds of issues, but it's being put together by people by those very same people, you know. So, you you know, in terms of questioning what the centre is, I agree. You know, it, it is problematic and very easy to fall back into that that space. I did hear um, uh, Gita Kapoor give a fabulous, and she has written something very interesting um, uh, for her text quite a number of years ago, and actually she gave a, an address. You pop, you might be able to hear it on. Uh, Tate um, uh, records, if you like, because they, they tend to take most of their lectures, where where Rashid Oreen was talking about, you know, the 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 the, the, the problem of, um, you know, being held constantly at, at the periphery, uh, to which Gita Kapoor, if I'm if memory serves me, made a wonderful comment, which was to say, well. You know, in India, I'm not at the periphery. I'm at the centre. And she has thereafter taken that very issue up. You know, she is a scholar who trained in in India. Um, so I I agree with you. I think you know with you both that they, they have they have to be looked at. But it might be something that you could you, know, you, you may be interested in in, in looking into further. Mm. But I agree. But there are some fantastic scholars at SOAS, you know, um, certainly from m my, my watching things and picking up stuff on through social media who are just, you, you know, there are scholars outside of, if you like, the Western hegemony, you know, the genemy, um, that are doing some extraordinary things. So, yeah. Rahul Rowe at SOAS is doing some really interesting work in this area as yeah. well. Yeah. Hi, um, thanks everybody for your contributions. Um, I've been thinking just on something that Jade said about collective action and that we're in an institution and we're in a symposium, but where does the action come after today? And thinking about a few things that have been mentioned to do with the teams of people that we work with if we do exist within an institution, what makes up the staff we work with? If that's an educational institution, what the syllabus, like, yeah, how the syllabus is shaped and who we're inviting into lecture, but also something you said about race, racial justice training, which I just thought was like a really exciting action to be like, okay, so who in this space sits within other institutions? After today, who has the platform or the, or their voice will be heard to go back and be like, we don't offer this within the teams we work in. We can offer this. And potentially that being a, a small, again, like there's a lot of work to me that needs to be done in lots of different ways, but an actual direct action to look at how those conversations um, can, yeah, can be broader in terms of being directly put into action which isn't necessarily a question, but just a statement from yeah. some of the stuff we brought up. Yeah, everyone's heard that now, so that's what you've all got to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think that's it um, for this panel. So Thank is you. There one question oh, here? There is one. It's okay. Um, I was just wondering oh, whether, the just there behind as well oh, okay. after. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, in terms of decolonizing the university, whether you know, what strikes me is that there's a lot of discussion around reforming uh, 
what are known to be very oppressive hierarchical institutions, the sort of big main institutions of every nation state. And um, I'm thinking about the way that, you know, in the last 20 or 30 years, for example, I've come back into our education. I'm really quite shocked at how similar it is to, uh, it was in the early 90s, like the discourses haven't massively changed. And you would think that what has happened over those, those last 30 years hasn't really happened. For example, you know, just the discussion of the Zapatistas or digital culture. And um, it strikes me that the imposition of exclusivity through um, school fees and the way that things like the REF works and peer review works as kind of consolidating mechanisms of the racism that we can see through visibility and representation really need to be looked at in, in this kind of web of gatekeeping <coughs> that's much more than, um, sorry, I get <laughs> now I'm speaking. Um, yeah, that's much more than just the staff structures and the sort of syllabus of these very big institutions. And I think mm. sometimes it's really frustrating that so much work has been done in alternative systems for schooling online or in community centers and that that stuff isn't being seen or recognized as, you know, the in very important work that it is and that um, these sort of invisible structures get to cut out that work um, very effectively and aren't, yeah, aren't tackled. I think it is shocking, actually. In about the 90s, it sort of feels a bit like the 50s sometimes, in, in truth, to me. And it is all about territory. I think REF is, 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 is indicative of, you know, of, of a reinstatement of, you know, territory, really. <coughs> how, do we, how do we manage that? Well, also, it also has the media folks. Um, mm. they're, actually, they're actually keeping people out of the university because those debates weren't conducted in peer reviewed environments. So yes. the entire mm. discourse is just yeah. out. And then people can't enter the university because maybe they chose for very political reasons not to take part in peer review, mm. which was clearly a racist um, institution. Or, you know, not, not all of it, the texts, and there are important publications that did manage to come in. But in terms of DIY self affirmation, that's not the kind of structure that people would have mm. wanted to make. And um, I, th I think it's really a tragedy. It's highly problematic, yeah, absolutely, I agree. Especially here in the UK, <coughs> beyond the kind of large academic problems. I, I mean, yeah, peer review is very problematic, it needs to be reviewed. There, there's structural problems that need to be reviewed, but we also have to remember that we're in a state of attack, really. And, and it's not just through the tuition fees, which is you know, the most visible issue, but it's through things like the prevent. Like, like, does everyone here know about Prevent? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's super fucked up. Um, you know, where, where they're trying to turn us as educators, you know, in, into spying on our own classrooms, you know? Um, and, and then one debate that, you know, one debate that y you see, I, I, that's not often very public, but, you know, amongst academics is how do we resist this? How do we resist Prevent? Because um, I, I refuse to do that. You know, I, I refuse to like turn my students in for being radicalized. Um, also, as a, as a side note of pride, uh, the university where I spent most of my time lecturing at just got note, voted uh, or listed as the home office one of the most radical, dangerous universities, Kingston. Fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but for precisely because we we try to encourage you know like ideas to come in, you know, because it's only through kind of a dialogical process that we can. You know, work through things, right? If you're if you're too afraid to talk about um, your beliefs or, or to have your views challenged, then then nothing's ever going to change. So, so at a very structural level, we have to think about the way that we're trying to police ourselves in the university space. Question. Um, yeah. I'll start by saying something positive. So <laughs> basically, it's great for you to be here. Um, as she said, like we don't actually. That's the first time I'm also studying here. I'm in my second year, so that's the first time I'm seeing something like that. But at the same time, I'd like to say I don't see many black people here, so um, I don't really know <laughs> what you mean by I haven't, I, I, that you've seen many 
uh, uh, like a diverse audience. Um, and then um, I'd like to jump on, like I'll just go up and down, left and right, because that's how my mind functions. Um, so Anthony, you say, you talk about like um, one of the biggest problem in France, the censorship. Um, mm. We don't have references at all. And for, in the case of Fanon, that's, that's quite horrible because um, that's one of the main fear, right? I actually, I was born in France, I grew up there. And the first time I read Fanon was in English. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I was saying, I was talking to my friend um, about that, and I was like, but what did I, what, what, what would have happened if I read Fanon when I was like 10 years old, right? Um, but it didn't happen. Um, and so, um, I think, like, for us to question the curriculum at an MA level, it's too late. It's like, <laughs> to have happened like from the grassroots um, and what can we expect from like OCA? Um, I mean I, that's a great university but can we like literally ask them to change completely and hire like as I said all the time like uh, more black staff or whatever because the black staff is there but it's just people who clean right um, so uh, also, um, that's like there is a question of uh, this is something I, I ask myself because I never know about what, like, but what do we really want? Like, because this question of like representation is so haunting, but what does it mean? Like, again, do we want like a thousand black people on TV, on cinema, whatever? Does it change really anything, right? Because at the end of the day, um, People are still like outside, literally <laughs> starving. I'm talking about like basic human needs <laughs> that um, we need to solve. Um, and again, like I don't have the answers, but I I believe that when we are when we applied um, to come at OCA, whatever the reasons, um, I believe that all of us had some sort of um, ambition, right? And and we know that once we're here, we have some power, right? Um, once we're getting out of OCA, people, even being here, like people look at us differently. I've got many anecdotes about that um, because, uh, again, I'm not from London. I, uh, since I'm here, people tend to smile more and listen to what I have to say. And I think like we have to organize ourselves because now we have some power and we can do it. Um, and rather than like just <laughs> walking past each other every day, we should like literally sit down and talk <laughs> and see what we can do. Um, and coming back to Jade and um, the pessimism, uh, like we, I think this is not like um, a fixed um, feeling, right? Like we go from optimism to pessimism to all sorts of like states, but I think like we have to remind ourselves like to basically stay optimist. Why? Because that's the only way out. <laughs> that's it. But again, thank you for thank being you. here. And um, yeah, I also have a question because it's called. Uh, sorry, maybe I talk too much. Uh, but then <laughs> I'll shut my mouth. Um, so yeah, the the symposium is called what 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 why people should do, right? Um, and I'll, again, like, I'll ask, I would love to ask the people who are here, uh, is that a question that you ask yourself every day? And do you talk about that also between yourself or with other people? Like, what do you do? Um, and do you have to do anything? I don't know. I think <laughs> this is just like a, a daily behavior that we have to have um, regardless of the color between one another, like as human beings, right? Like, that's it. Thank you. I think it is a, uh, <laughs> a very good point there. I think we're going to have to wrap it up uh, at this stage, but there'll be plenty of time to talk over lunch and later on as well, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was enjoyable.
could have gone on longer. And oh, God. Yeah, yeah. Thank you.